Yeah, hello everyone. Um, thank you for being here. You know, I'm I'm all about trying to make it as uh, personal and engaging as we can in Zoom. So if you do have questions or even just uh, are brave enough to turn your video on to that even just, you know, brings us into as a community of learners. So um, I'd appreciate that anybody that's able to or willing to do that as well uh, for this time. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Appreciate that. Um, so Again, my name is Obi Corliss. Uh, I am a steel pan musician, uh, born and raised um, in Lakewood, Washington, right by Pierce College, Fort Stillicum actually, um, is uh, where I was born and raised. Um, a little, just a little bit about me. I got into steel pan um, as a musician. Um, I started from learning from my father who was a native of Trinidad and Tobago and was a lifetime musician himself growing up. And when he uh, decided to be with my mom and start a family in Washington state, he kind of converted to steel pan. Um, as you may have picked up in the, in the area, um, there's not a lot of steel pan activity or we're probably you know, halfway around the world from where it's the instrument originated from the Pacific Northwest all the way to the bottom corner of the Caribbean. So uh, it's like well over 4,000 miles away. Uh, and so when he came out here, he wanted to start a steel band, you know, partly because it was unique and kind of supply and demand. He used to play the trumpet, but wanted to get into steel pan. And I was kind of right there at the, just as a young kid at the genesis of the steel band and starting in my family. And so, uh, started with a few other guys from the Caribbean that my dad knew in Washington. And so they were all from different Islanders and they started a band called the Islanders. Um, and I was just kind of part of that growing up. Uh, so I had steel pan at home and I did many of the things uh, that maybe you're used to from, I did the whole school band thing on trumpet, fourth grade, all the way through 12 jazz band, pep band, marching band, solo and ensemble, all state. Uh, all everything top down in school. Um, and, but steel pan was really what I wanted to focus on. And so um, I continued with percussion studies in college um, for a bachelor's degree. Um, and right now I'm currently enrolled in at Northern Illinois University in Illinois, um, doing a master's in steel pan, specifically steel pan performance. Um, it's one of the only institutions in the world where you can focus on steel pan as a performing arts. Um, just by show of hands, there are people that are here or anyone uh, just in the chat. Uh, if you've been in a band program or are pursuing music or um, have any type of organized experience around music or performing in any way. Uh, maybe if you want to use a thumbs up, if you want to go in the chat and say yes. Oh, well, I see a lot of thumbs up. That's efficient. Yeah, thumbs up popping up. Okay. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, definitely over half of you, probably about three quarters. So that's that's good to know. So have a few musicians in the room. So I, I, I don't want to make this too music music heavy per se, but I do want you all to walk away with some concepts about the instrument about the connection to some of the other native art forms that you probably studied with Soka and Calypso. And then kind of keep it a little more practical with, you know, what's next with the instrument and where, where can this go and what's, what's out there for you to maybe look into um, in, your, in your own respect. Because um, somebody asked this question and, I'm, and I wanna come back to this probably a few times. It's actually the core thing that I wanna uh, center around is someone asked what type of music is steel pan and is it its own type of music or part of a certain culture and that's that's a big point that I want to uh, to come back to um, and actually maybe I'll pull up this little can I do a screen share I kind of have I took I took the questions that you wrote Dr. Bove and now uh, from the students and kind of try to categorize them a little bit and have a few answers kind of segmented for that. Okay. If that's okay. Um, so if I do a share, 
let's see, let's go here, share, and let's start from here, share and play. Um, all right, so I had a few things I wanted. So these are, I wanna center around the questions from the class um, and tie this into some of my own content and link it back to some of the things you've already uh, been introduced to with the class. So um, with the history, starting with the history of the instrument. Um, as you may know and have maybe previewed in your text and from uh, Dr. Bove's website, this instrument um, is, a, is a new creation. Um, it's, and, and I wanna distinguish between the instrument and the culture and the background and historical context that created the instrument. And, and also number two, wanna separate from the genres of music that are tied to this place of origin, but also not, ex, not necessarily tied to the instrument. And that's a big misconception around the world globally that I wanna break down. So we're talking about Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is an island it's about, Washington State's about 34 times bigger than the, state, than the country of Trinidad and Tobago. So we're talking about this island, these two islands that are right here. I have the dark purple is Washington State and you see Trinidad and then this little part off, the, off of it is called Tobago. And those two are Trinidad and Tobago. And so we're talking about a place that it says right here, 2.98% the size of Washington State and it has 5.5 million less people out of just over a million people. So we're pretty much talking about like Tacoma, Seattle and Olympia as a country, just to put it in perspective of where this is coming from, from the world. All right, so how did this thing happen and start in Trinidad? Why Trinidad? Where, why, what was going on in some of the key events? So one thing to understand at the time, obviously, is you have, um, you know, we're, we're talking about an instrument that has its, its modern, it's the only instrument created in the 20th century. This is a new instrument, a new sound of an inch, of body of instruments to the world. Um, with a modern history of about, since about 1950, 40-ish. Um, it's still hard to pinpoint it, and you can go deep into the literature and deep into the scholarly text of who made the first pan and where and why, and there's a lot of debate around that um, because of how organic it was to the culture and to what was going on at the time. You back up about 60 years before into the 1880s um, is when, well, let's back up maybe about 150 years before you have several generations of transatlantic slave trade, okay? coming through the Caribbean, bringing people from all over, from West Africa, through Brazil and South America. Um, and then you have a Creole culture, meaning a mix up of people that were brought from one country, but kind of indoctrinated under a third, a second country and living in a third country. So you might be from Angola, raised on a Dutch colony, and then traded to live in uh, Trinidad and Tobago under an English colony. So several different cultures, many generations of people um, and drumming, hand drumming has always been essential to um, all civilizations around the world, particularly West African people. So now when we fast forward to the 1880s when steel pan was banned, or excuse me, drumming was banned in the Caribbean, we're not just talking about just recreational drumming like oh you know sometimes I, I take djembe classes but now my classes are canceled so it's like no more drumming we're talking about full-on religious practices and ways of life that are centered around drumming um, that were really just banned out of intimidation the intimidation coming from a lack of understanding particularly from western europeans not understanding the intensity and the religious connection that comes with the drumming and the African traditions and the dancing and the gathering. Uh, when they hear the loud, when, when colonists would hear this, the loud drumming, the gathering, the chants and different languages that they didn't understand, they felt very intimidated. They didn't know if 
that was, hey, are they about to rob us? Are they about to take off? What are they talking about? I don't know. So there's a lot of fear. And because of that fear, there was just banned out route, outright. Um, so again, very naive decision, but none again, the truth. And so that, um, that started um, a trend to now get back to the music. How do you get back to the music? Well, you get back to it by creating instruments. And that's where this concept of found percussion comes in for um, Trinidadian people at the time. It's bringing, being resourceful to try to get back to a core essential place where you can have your cultural practices and, 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 and particularly the religious and spiritual aspects of it too. Um, now this is only like less than an hour and there are so many things that I, I mean, I can do this one little part can be a four day session if we really wanted to make it. So I'm kind of skipping over a lot, but um, I want you to know some kind of the key thing right here is somebody asked how were enslaved Africans inspired to play music like this? They seem very motivated to make this happen. Consider they use random objects to start off. How did they start? So the starting comes from thousands of years of generational drumming and spiritual practice and, and, and um, conditions that they're used to. Now, when you go into the tambu bamboo made out of bamboo stocks, um, again, that's an aspect of um, percussion. Now you're mixing in the culture because at the time too, you have the carnival tradition and the street parades that were introduced from the French colonists as a, as a French European practice that local Trinidadians begin to embrace and adapt in their own ways while also bringing in their own West African cultures into the practice as well. So you have this mix. A big part of it on the street is the portability, the moveability to dance and play and move in unison, kind of that street presence um, was very profound considering that you're talking about a people that mostly lived under slavery and under, um, very uh, intense persecution or secured environment. The opportunity to go out in the street, in public with your own instrument was very profound. So that's a big part of where that, that motivation came from. Um, so now you go into the steel pan aspect of it. How do you go from bamboo to steel? Well, again, it's an evolution from trying to have more durable instruments, just from practicality. Bamboo is organic, it'll break if you, play it too long, or as you saw in the videos, the stomping and the syncopations on the ground, things like that, that's going to that's gonna break down the instrument over time. So there's a natural tendency to, to find something more durable, like me metallic options, like biscuit tins, like kerosene cans, gas cans. Like uh, when I went to Trinidad in, in 2012 for the first time, one of the sweetest sounds I ever heard was a guy had the, had the, the engine uh, 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 what do you call it? The little motor in the back of a refrigerator, believe it or not. And he was walking down the street. It was like the best bell I ever heard. And he said he got it from a refrigerator. So um, this is where you get this evolution of metallic objects. In the 1940s, um, there's a major world event that was happening at the time. Anyone know by chance what that event was in the world? I want to say it, come off mute or put it in the chat real quick. Early 1940s, major world event. It has the world, the word world in it, actually, as the name of the event. Let's get active in the chat. World War II. World War II, yes. World War II. That becomes prominent because at the time during World War II, you know, war takes a lot of resources, you know, a lot of battleships and airplanes and all kinds of things like that. Those ships and those planes were fueled by oil and kerosene and things that came out of 55 gallon oil drums. Those oil drums were actually being produced in Trinidad. Trinidad is a naval fueling port, port was a partnership for the Allied uh, Union in the United States, even besides oil. Trinidad is one of the world's largest exports of asphalt, like, con like to pave roads. They have a big natural lake that just shoots asphalt out the ground and they sell that in oil drums. Actually, the Narrows Bridge in Tacoma is paved from asphalt from the Pitch Lake Asphalt Lake in Trinidad. So you got all these oil drums and there need even more oil drums because we need to get oil over to Europe and there's a war going on. So the extra oil drums being produced 
was just a perfect storm for interested people that wanted to, were looking for oil or metallic items to make instruments. So it just happened to be, hey, we're in the one of the leading world exports of oil with the, pit, with the world, the war, let's use some of that. And this was not like, hey, let me go down to the store real quick. They got a sale two for 10 bucks. I'm gonna be right back. You know, it was like a major deal to steal items from a military base. I mean, that'd be the same today if you tried to just walk up to JBLM and say, hey, can I, you know, just borrow a truck or something. So they were stealing items. People were trying to acquire them in different ways. And all of this is happening in extremely competitive and extremely poor environments around Trinidad and Tobago. You might have read about the fighting and even it's talked about, I have on the screen here, why were women not allowed and things like that. That is because um, Steel Pan in its early foundations and all of these street musicians were really street gangs, like Bloods, Crips, GDs, whatever you want to relate it to in today's terminology. These were the baddest of the baddest on the street. And they just happened to have an interest in music as well. So the reputation was, you know, wherever you saw Steel Pan or wherever you heard Steel Pan, you're probably right in the heart of some very violent or violent prone people and situations. Um, so this wasn't like I'm getting lessons, you know, at the university with my private tutor and it's all nice and safe and organized. This is like you're in the back of the back doing with stolen merchandise, trying to create an instrument, hiding while doing it with your friends, like super unscrupulous, illegal stuff. Um, and so this all came about, um, but the, the push for it was to get a better sound. The push of this whole thing, and how do we go from just a biscuit tin or just tambu bamboo to the instruments we have today is because it's extremely competitive and it was a push to have a greater sound. Like, for example, if I was the, in a band, I'm the band leader, I have this one oil drum, I just turned it into, I have three notes on it, no one's ever seen this. I think I got the hottest thing cooking and we go on parade and we think we got it and I make a couple more for my friends and I think I'm doing it big. Then I go see the band across the way and I go listen to them and they all got notes and they got six notes on their drums. I thought I was big time, I got three. So they got six. So now I gotta figure out how to steal more drums or get more instruments so I could try and create something on my own that's gonna rival them or even better. So it was always an element of wanting up and wanting up. And that's what ties into, um, I'm gonna stop share for a second. Um, that's what ties into, you might see when you look for steel pan, a lot of the examples you might have found have been referenced around the national competition panorama and the bigger steel bands because everything from inception was how do we get bigger and better and and be, and we have rival gangs and these gangs used to actually physically fight like if i saw you on the street with my gang and with the other band we're going to put our instruments down and we're going to get them up and i might steal your shit excuse my language i might steal your stuff and I might, this is, this is for real because this is real musical, uh, musical turf here. So now, how do you get past that? In 1963, the government actually sponsors a steel pan competition for the, for the country of Trinidad and Tobago called Panorama. They say, hey, stop the fighting. You guys wanna, look, we're gonna sponsor and we're gonna have a prize, cash money for the best band. So now that same physical energy and fighting is now transferred into musical energy and that's what pushed continue to push the development to now we have the steel orchestra with what we have today with modern with soprano alto cello baritone bass all the voices all the sizes all the instruments um i'm jumping to the chat just to see oh someone says thanks cool um so the competition aspect and the push to get the instrument is from very competitive from um, and then you even have the, there's some classism where, you know, well, even to this day, but definitely 200 years ago or 150 years ago, and it's going into the early part of the 20th century, we still have racism and classism, um, against black and brown people. Um, and that was very true 
um, in the early 20th century in Trinidad. And part of the aspect of to, to make the instrument better was to gain respect. You know, the music that was toted of the day were the high classics like Vivaldi or Chopin or Debussy or somebody, anybody can play some French sonata suites in A minor, one through six, all movements. Those were the musics that were praised. But the only, the only way you can play those musics is you need to have an instrument to match that caliber as well to present the music. So that's when you get into newer tunings and advanced tunings that make the instrument better than what it was. So let me see if I have a couple examples here. Um, any, any questions too along while I'm here? I like questions, I really, really do. Um, that keeps, keeps me honest with what we're doing. But if you don't have any questions, that's all good too. Um, so in the earlier, the earliest instruments, um, if you heard them, you, you probably, you know, it's with your ears and where we're at today, um, might not have a feel or, uh, it might not, it'll sound, you might say right away, like, oh, it sounds kind of, it sounds kind of uh, like out of tune or, you know, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure what this is about. So I'm gonna do, let's see, if I wanna do a uh, audio, if I just share my screen, is the audio automatic or do I have to do one more setting uh, for that? When you go to share screen, bottom left corner should have a little box that you click to say share computer audio and you have to make share it. Share sound. Yeah. Cool. All right, cool. Let's share. Let's let's go here. Um, oops. Am I sharing? Okay, I'm sharing. So let's listen to this is around the early 40s, 1947, early recordings. This would be on a street parade, maybe carnival time, maybe not. Um, but take a second and listen to the quality of the instrument from where we started and then to where we're going to where we're going to go next. So pay attention to the quality of the steel pan here. Oh. Sorry, Obey, if it's playing, we can't hear it. Can we try sharing again? Um, when you click share screen, have share sound, um, and then maybe try sharing your whole desktop. That might help. My computer's there to restart, but I'm still here. <laughs> uh, so what I want to speak on with that, you heard there's a simple melody. 
but the harmonics wasn't there. So we're doing this song. So in, in modern tuning and modern harmonics, modern instruments, we've now added so much a deeper layer to um, the pan has what we call harmonics, where the note, the fundamental note that you're hitting, you have several octaves and intervals tuned into the one note that are resonating at sympathetic volumes or sympathetic octaves above and, and trigger the whole pan to resonate in its own unique way. Um, that's purely um, an addition from Dr. Ellie Manette, um, the late Dr. Ellie Manette, who added uh, those octaves and those uh, uh, partials into the fundamentals of each note. Um, we don't have that any, or they didn't have that at the time. And so, so the brilliance that is what people are known and attracted to a steel pan that we hear and we understand now, that wasn't, that wasn't there. Um, and so when you're, it's part of the sound that you love uh, was a modern evolution to, to um, and borrowed from other harmonics from like marimba building and piano tuning to, to take those same concepts and put that into uh, the steel pan instrument. So I'm going to jump back on the zoom here. Cool. Uh, Any other, any questions? I feel like I asked that a lot, but I, I really wanna make sure that um, uh, there's a, there's a, any, any questions or any doubt on what this is or exposure to it, I wanna make sure are clear for, for people moving forward. Again, it's just, I'm one person, one perspective, but uh, let's jump back in. I'm gonna do another, I think I, back on can i get back on here yep launch meeting as attendee open um victoria you have a question can you unmute and ask it yes i can okay thank you um so when it comes to performing steel pan do you happen to have any uniforms that you specifically wear sure uh that that's come up um uh, a few times when people had that question about uniforms. Uh, I personally, um, well, let me start bigger. Uh, Panorama, the main competition, uh, oftentimes you might, you, more oftentimes you'll see white pants and white shoes and then some type of vibrant top, but the, there really isn't a, a uniform because Again, um, there isn't as specific cultural or like spiritual ties that people are doing. So it's, it's very modern or contemporary to whatever's comfortable to you. Um, I've seen, you know, just polo t-shirts and jeans. You could wear all black, more of the concert attire, tuxedos, maybe. Obviously, I think the biggest thing, it just depends on the setting and the audience. Um, even in my own performances, if I'm doing a wedding at someone, if I'm playing for someone's wedding or something, I'm going to be a little more formal, maybe a suit jacket or a tie or something. If it's a little more casual or a certain theme or something or, uh, that the, the, the event has or that the client has, I'm going to, I'm going to match that theme or try to be fitting in that way. So overall, there isn't a, a specific uniform um, that you might see that's more custom to like a classical orchestral player maybe always wearing a tuxedo or the all black look or something to that effect. Anything else? I actually had a question. Um, I know that like there was competition like changing like like when you saw someone with a better instrument you'd like want to make your instrument better. Um, mm -hmm. does that still go on today or is it kind of like has it like peaked kind of like you got the best instruments now uh yeah i think um 
I, I, I think that the, the curve of that has leveled out. It's not as steep of advancements every year like it was 60, 70 years ago. Um, but I do definitely know for sure that the competitive aspect is still there. You know, you know talk about the panorama competition in Trinidad. Um, there's several categories that go from single pan to small, medium, and large band. The large category goes up to 140 players. Um, and that's after they make cuts. So they have, you know, they're cutting down to the best of the best of the best of the best um, to stay in the band. And, and it's, it's all or nothing cash prize. It's 2 million TTs, Trinidad and Tobago dollars, which is about 140 or 100, uh, 2 million TTs is like about $200,000. Um, so cash money. So there's money on the line for the band, which means that's money coming in for the players that get paid. That means that's money coming in for that particular neighborhood or that community. So um, it's very serious in that way. Not as many new advancements in the instruments per se, um, but I, there are still advancements in the presentation, the, the delivery, the just the musicality. So that puts a lot of pressure on the composers to write and be creative in the music they play. Um, I look at Duvon Stewart, for example, um, with Renegade Steel Orchestra in Trinidad. He's one of the most innovative guys. He, and he brought in last year, he won, and, or two years ago, when he won two years ago, he had this whole thing with uh, pyrometr pyrometrics and all kind of fire and stuff and rockets shooting across the stage at exact time with the music and everything. So again, that's the presentation side of it, which again, because it's competitive. Uh, Brady put a question in the chat. When does Panorama take place and what is it like? When does Panorama take place? Panorama takes place right about now, if it was happening. Um, it's kind of weird. I, there's an announcement that there is like a panorama, but like the government said there is, but no one really is going to play because of COVID. It's kind of weird. So, but it happens around this time. It goes with the off the Lent, so Lent calendar. So it's 40, 40 days, well, 41 days before Easter is Carnival Tuesday. And Easter's in April, but that date changes every year. So you have to kind of look at the calendar. Um, and so for anyone that maybe is a belief of the, are familiar with the Catholic Church specifically, you have the Lent season. Lent uh, is reflective of the 40 days that Jesus Christ was, um, and, or excuse, and yeah, 40 days of being, of, of repentance and being separated from your, your worldly understanding and and focusing on getting back in touch with your faith. And in that 40 days, you're supposed to give up something. And so prior to that, the day before that happens in Trinidad is Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday means you put the ash and the cross on your head and you say, I am acknowledging my faith in Jesus Christ and I'm committed to being a better Christian or Catholic. The day before that is carnival on Tuesday which is one of the biggest street parties in the world. Um, if you just look up Carnival Tuesday, um, just imagine like 2 million people in parade going down Meridian Ave coming to Pierce College on one day um, from all over the world. Like just that's like how big it is. Um, the competition happens the Saturday before that. So there's a huge kind of climax into the Carnival Tuesday with um, several competitions um, before that. Um, I want to I want to jump into, I have a few examples. I wanted to show some non-traditional ways because um, one of the things I want to impart you with are some other examples of how this instrument's being featured. Uh, First off, I want to go to, am I, I'm back on the Zoom. Here we go. Launch meeting, main the meeting. Y'all see me? Okay. So I'm going to do share, share sound, share, mute.
Obey, we can't hear you. Your 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 volume's muted for you speaking. Oh, sorry. This is put on. This is called Pan Rocks. It's a project um, that was put on by Tracy Thornton. He looks. He is a rock drummer, like from the '80s, like full on metal rock slasher, everything. And now in his later part of life, he's in his fifties. He's in Pan, but he's decided to put all his favorite rock tunes for a steel band. Um, and so here's a sample of uh, YYZ by the group by Pan Rocks. This we got any audio? Audio? No, 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 no. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Right. Um, is it just, do you have an echo or is that just me? Right at first and now it's okay. Okay, if it's just me, I don't care. Um, so that's again, rock and roll. Steel pan. Again, steel pan is not a genre. Steel pan is an instrument that can play in multiple genres. Um, I want to highlight, this is one of my other favorite players. Uh, his name is Jason Baptiste. And I really like him because he's exceptional with using four sticks on the steel band. So here he's going to be playing a tune called Besame Mucho, written by Mexican composer Consuelo Velasquez. We'll stop. We'll stop there. 
a little sample of the four stick technique on the double tenors from Mr. Jason Baptiste. Um, I wish I could play double tenors. They're a whole different layout. Um, they have an advantage that more chords are built on one side and then you have more chords built on the other side so you can play things more together. Um, but it's a whole different layout. Um, I'm trying to go back to my videos here. This is a piece coming up here. Uh, straight up blues. Victor Provost group. He, Victor Provost, he is a steel pan player from the Virgin Islands. He, teach, he teaches jazz music at George Mason University in Washington, D.C., actually in Virginia. But uh, straight up blues bebop guy on steel pan. <laughs> So that's Victor Provost. He actually plays, it looks like a tenor pan, but actually um, there's been a new kind of invention um, maybe the last 10 years where instead of taking the, like the 20, 26 inch pan, people are using like the 29 inch pan as a diameter. And you can put more notes on a tenor pan. So he has like this extended range pan that's a, uh, pretty cool and he likes to put these little foam pad things on the side to hold his pan in one specific place so it doesn't shift smart smart idea um but you might pick up on some of that so that's victor provost from the virgin islands let's go back to my I had a bunch of videos open just before the crash so i'm just going to go to my history and pull them up uh somebody was asking about zz the zzb that's on a tenor pan uh, uh, yeah. Right. Tenor pan. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of figured they sounded, uh, you know, very similar. <laughs> yes. Um. Let's see. Something you won't see too much is music written for the bass steel pan specifically. Um. So in the hierarchy of musicians and steel pan especially in the United States. Most people that want to venture out as a soloist or performer in their own right, probably nine out of 10 are gonna play, uh, I'll say eight out of 10 for whole numbers. Eight out of 10 are gonna be on the tenor pan because in the North American lexicon or vernacular, we call it the lead. So if you're trying to be a band or lead a band, you might play the lead pan, but you don't have to. I think more on a practical sense, it's the smallest and the lightest. So you only have to carry one pan as one person versus if you play the double seconds, that's two. If you play the triple cello, that's three. And each three is bigger, twice the size. So pretty much if you want to be anything beyond a double second player, you need to have a band or an SUV um, to make the game and, and a big apartment. 
But uh, Yuko Asada, she, uh, she's a musician. Actually, she's one of the co-directors at my graduate school right now, Northern Illinois. And she wrote a series of pieces called uh, Opposite Attraction. So she wrote it for the highest voice tenor pan and the lowest voice bass, opposite ends of the spectrum playing together. So check this out. Oh, after you booked a sunny Verbo ski chalet with endless views of snow covered peaks. But the thing they'll remember. have a few questions in the chat if you want me to read them to you Obe. yeah please um elliot asks uh what are the difference between the different types of steel drums and do you have a favorite yeah i definitely like the the uh the double seconds the best i think it um i think it gives the most versatility um in terms of it has the higher range like a tenor pan, but at the same time, it has more of a warmth to it that's not as bright as the soprano voice. It has a warmth to it that fits better, I think, in an ensemble setting when you're playing with other people. So you're not constantly ringing over the highest range. You can kind of blend and do other chords and stuff. And I think that is, as a soloist and playing with other types of people, steel panists or not, or vocalists, I think it fits, fits best um in, in that setting and then it's again practicality it's it's i really like to be honest i really like the cellos the best but practicality it's almost like impossible to transport those as like one person by yourself like it's just not even worth it so that's kind of the, the downside um i do have some questions here uh i see um I wanted to get into like uh, some opportunities and some of the people asked a lot of personal questions, which are cool too. Um, like what does steel pan music mean to me? Um, and what should a person interested in playing know before starting? Uh, be for me, it's a connection to my own heritage and my own background as an Afro Trinidadian American. Um, it's probably the only thing I knew about, you know, my, my home country and my home place before I actually got to go there. I was probably about 25 when I first went to Trinidad to even visit family or anything. So like playing steel pen was like, and, and then Calypso, which I didn't talk as much about is a, is a, is a lyrical and an art form, a lyrical style that was commonly associated because that's the two things Trinidad is known for that's 
purely Trinidadian is Calypso music and Soca music, and then also Steel Pan. Those are rooted in Trinidad. So for them to go together is more because they're rooted in the same country, but not because they have to, the Steel Pan doesn't have to play Calypso, the Calypso doesn't have to be done with Steel Pan. That's just two ironic things of them being together um, and founded in the same country. I would say it that way. Um, number two, um, you know, what, what do I enjoy the most about Steel Pan? I just, and what should someone know getting into it? It's another musical instrument. The same scales, the same practice time, the same rehearsals you have to go to on saxophone, on piano, on for choir, on ukulele, um, whatever you want to do, it takes the same musical discipline, no more, no less. And that's something that's been stressed um, from the pioneers of this instrument and to the forefathers and even to the respect it has now to being at a, at a university level and recognized as an instrument um, in a school of music is because of uh, the, what it takes to perform on it is no different than um, any other instrument. Let's see. More questions, any more questions? Let's see, I have, I'm looking at, um, what am I looking at here? I'm looking at my screen. I have questions from, uh, questions from, I got into playing from my dad. Uh, did going to college change or advance your talent? I for sure think it advanced my, my understanding of music. Um, you know, going through a formal music theory and ear training and doing all those things, anytime you dedicate time to your craft is going to be important. So um, uh, one specific area, I definitely said my music theory and chords and understanding how to compose really was very positive. Um, let's see. What else can I share or say? Somebody yeah, hit me. The chat too still. Um, Reed asked, uh, with steel pans being made out of discarded oil cans, does it matter if they were previously dented or not? Will that affect the sound? Yes, it does. Um, there's actually a whole science behind uh, steel pan construction called, I kept saying, I always say this wrong way, metallurgy, met, met, metallurgy, metallurgy, metallurgy. And it's the science of what is the perfect metal that is going to make a steel pan? Um, before, again, it was just oil drums that were made for transporting oil that are now turned into instruments. But now manufacturers are specifically making specific type of metal and shaping the oil drums with a specific comp compound of metal to make musical instruments, to make pans, steel pans from them. So um, it is dense and things are get in the way you know it's it's just like if you were going to build a car but like one of the pieces had a dent on it how's that going to affect the rest you know might not but it might throw it off a little bit so obviously you want to have undented um uh and quality materials just to ensure the quality of the entire instrument um let's see so technique and pedagogy for anyone that's getting into teaching some questions are what are the differences in different kinds um you know some because i think the biggest thing is the spatial when you get to bigger instruments like the bass and whatnot you have to actually spread out and be more kinesthetic and physical in your movements moving around to it whereas everything in the tenor pan like i have right here next to me it's all right here you know i have i have 30 notes right within a wrist movement of my hand I don't have to stand up. I'm actually sit down and play. You don't get that with uh, other instruments. So that's kind of the hardest part. Um, and the notes obviously switching around. So you have to do some mental gymnastics and it treat each voice like a different instrument. Um, let's see. Uh, what's different? Can you get used to moving my hands in different spaces? It just takes time. It's like learning a dance. It's like learning how to, to salsa dance. You know, you learn the right steps that go with the right songs and you, you learn the right hand movements that go with the right things and that becomes each song. So that's how you're able to, um, you might've heard uh, somebody ask about rote teaching. I think I saw that question um, or reading from sheet music, the oral tradition. Um, 
steel pen is very visual. You know, I can stand next to someone and watch where their hands go and then copy them and play the same thing without looking at sheet music because I can see the physical movements. Um, you know, you might not get that per se with just a violin, just teach me by watching because the, the movements are so fine and so uh, minimal. You can't tell the difference, but with pan, you can watch someone physically and that's where that rote teaching style um, is an advantage. If you're not a sheet music reader, that's, that's okay. I have taught steel pan to people formally, informally. Um, I think it's one of the greatest instruments to introduce someone to the music because you don't have to have the technical strain of learning how to put your mouth in a mouthpiece and you know, that takes about a year just to get that part right. Whereas I can take any of you in this class right now, if you were next to me, and in 10 minutes time, five minutes time, we can be playing a song together right off the street, anyone. So it's huge advantages um, that way. I was taught kind of in a combination of both with the sheet music at school. And that was one type of training. And then at home, it was a lot of like, Simon says, repeat after me, you try this, I try this, I do this, okay, copy me. And we learn songs in chunks, four bars at a time, eight bars at a time. And then that becomes, and then we just loop it and memorize it and memorize it. And that's how I learned songs. Uh, let me hit the play button here. Okay. I have so many windows open. This is so bad. Uh, I see a hand up. Was that question already answered? Uh, Briggs, do you want to unmute and ask a question? So going off the question, Reed asked regarding how, if there's a dent, can like the sound be effective? So let's say you have like heat damage or like, like you said, a dent in your steel pan. Would you go to tune it yourself or would you have to just buy a whole new one? Very good question. So if I have any type of physical damage, if it dropped um, heat, that's a great point. Um, direct sunlight, um, even though it's from a tropical island, direct sunlight on the instrument is the worst thing to have to do in the steel pan because it actually softens the metal and warps it. And that changes the, the this characteristics. If any of that happens, I do have to go to a tuner. Um, maybe not immediately. If I probably drop it and whole thing gets smashed in like it got hit by a car, then it's probably toast and I need a new one, but little dings and stuff, it might mess up a note or two, but you can get that fixed with the tuner and they have to actually come back and tune it and using a strobe tuner that measures all the frequencies of the, of the instrument and they're hammering it and tilting the needle and getting it right in tune. And you have to, it's a very specialized process. Um, people dedicate seven to 10 years to even become a professional tuner. It's like in a full apprenticeship. Um, I've never taken a hammer to my pants just because I know how serious it is and I just wouldn't even chance that. Um, so that's, yeah, a little bit about denning. I want to highlight a scene on the study guide. You guys had a little podcast from Vance. I actually know Vance. Um, this is Vance on the right. Um, Vance and I, we met at a workshop in St. Lucia playing pan uh, four years, five years ago. And uh, since then have crossed paths at different panoramas around the world in Trinidad. This is panorama in New York um, where we played together. And uh, he's one of my kind of pan fraternity brothers. Um, we just have a passion for pan. He actually plays piano, being a believe it or not. He majored in piano and fell in love with pan and uh, does that. Um, wow, we're coming up on an hour really fast. Um, I hear, here's Dr. Ellie Manette tuning a pan. He's one of the founding fathers that created, uh, created the, created the cello pan, created all of our modern tuning technology for pan. Um, and he's, yeah, uh, the U.S. Navy hired him in the fifties to build the United States Navy steel band. Um, they handpicked him to do that. Uh, you, uh, and there's a whole book about that called uh, U.S. Navy Ambassadors. Um, Soka and Calypso, didn't get too much into that, but again, these are genres of music. Steel pan is an instrument family. The instrument can play any genre. Classical, rock, rap, contemporary. If you want to say Soka, sure. If you like heavy metal death, music, that's cool. If you like 80s battle rap, that's cool too. 
whatever your flow is, you can apply the steel pan to it because it uses the same musical principles as an instrument. Uh, maybe last thing, maybe one more, two personal questions um, that I didn't answer. Uh, when I, what, what did I look up when I first started playing steel pan that kept me motivated and keep learning? Um, <laughs> so when I first started, this was like before YouTube, um, before Spotify, before any, you could like really like just find people on any social media. I had this one VHS tape. It was Panorama 1997 on VHS. And I would watch that video every day after school. It was like an hour video. And I'd watch all the bands play, the finalist bands, and I would study them. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to be in the band. I wanted to be in a bigger band. I wanted to go beyond what I was doing at home. And that was the only example I could find that was like more players playing. Um, so I'd watch that. I would try to copy stuff. Um, and I just wanted to learn more music. It was fun to play more things. It was fun to get the audience reaction. Um, and then it's fun when you get even paid and someone wants to pay you to come play. So those were some of my earliest motivations where I got to experience like, hey, the better I am, the better responses I get. And this is, I wanna keep getting more favorable um, responses. So I know we're coming up towards the end, a little over time. I want to just thank thank you for having me. And the key takeaways about this instrument is that it's the newest instrument in the world, only instrument created in the 20th century. No one knows where the potential is. It doesn't have the 300, 400 year history like these other instruments that are established in certain ways. This is such a raw, hey, we're talking less than 100 years of history of an instrument um, that's just now emerging in the height of globalization in this world in the in the world we know today so um there's so many more places that it can go um and it doesn't have to be bound to what the original pioneers of the instrument did with it around soca and calypso because that's what they knew in their culture in their time again we're talking one a place that's about three percent the size of washington so that's such a small island and, and so many people want to come through Trinidad and say, I played in Trinidad. You know, I went to Panorama and I competed and I played with, I played, which is great. And I was one of those two, even myself. Again, I explained kind of for cultural and personal reasons, connecting to my own culture. But even if after I did that and I said, you know what, there's so much more out there. There's so many more avenues I don't need to compete with all of the people that are trying to do the same avenue. Let me find my voice and be shared and find ways to express myself and continue on in a new way. So that's kind of where I'm at with this journey going back to school and, and, and refining my voice around this instrument. And who knows, there might even be a new genre that might come out where the steel pan hits it at the same time. And now you have some new like country house music genre i don't know with with steel pen i don't know um and you if there's any composers in the room or any um musicians that want to uh bring this into your own music treat it like another sound so this is another layer it's like another spice from the spice cabinet i want to cook with this put it in my music nothing more nothing less you can use a lot of it you might not use it at all but it is a flavor it's a taste that can be a part of your own musical experience and um, thank you. Thank you so much. Can we all give a round of applause? Maybe even if it's just in your reacts, show our appreciation. And awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if you want to stick around to answer a couple more, maybe questions from some people who are still here, but otherwise we're good. I'm going to stop the recording at this point.